American University in Bulgaria. So because you get the American in the group who, gets, who feels the need to start on time, and also because some folks need to leave a, um, out of here early, I want to make sure that you all get a chance to kind of see through to the end of the presentation. Um, part of the idea behind this was to give you all a chance to also see kind of how you can make choices within your life. And that part of it doesn't have to be that the only time you have fun and you do crazy things is when you're in college. And so that maybe um, thinking about how now, thinking about how you can weave in all of these ideas that you love to do now and keep hold of some of them as you go on. And so part of what I'm gonna be doing is bringing in some of the conversations that we have in terms of just, it comes from a lot from childhood development kind of uh, research in that area, research in neuroscience, psychology, and some of these others, about how important things like fandom and fun are in a general understanding of our life and how we continue to grow and change. And then I have an example of, in my own life, how I try to bring that in with the things that I study and what I do. Um, and so weaving both fan kind of elements as well as fun into even choices as mundane as what I do for a conference at uh, an academic conference. So that's the kind of plan for today to kind of talk through those ideas. So the first one is looking at this idea of the importance of fandom. And so one of the things that students often ask, so I wear purple a lot, and there's a reason. Um, it's partially because my first forum into fandom was from Kansas State University, and Mark has K-State t-shirt on right now. <laughs> um, mine were dirty, so I brought purple, and I have plenty of it. And so it was, my mom went to K-State, my grandmother was actually one of the first women who graduated from the, um, the college that was there at the time, which was a normal college, which means teaching college. And so she was one of the first female graduates um, of that institution. And so it was kind of a long history in my family. And so for us, that fandom was a big part of it. And aside from all of the pictures, if you Google Kansas State University, we're crazy in general in terms of fans, very fanatical um, of our university. Partly the reason why I chose this picture as opposed to any of the others that you might find is because it does talk about this idea of family. One of the reasons why fandom is so important is because it allows us to create a family that goes beyond the family that we may have in terms of blood relatives and those, that we start to create family and that feeling of closeness with others based on the things that we love as well. So it has a feature of, of, in terms of fandom in general, of helping us to stabilize and create an identity, one that can be lasting, one that we understand who we are and who we wanna be. It also has this notion of family, and with family and identity, particularly with family, the notion of it, then the idea of shelter and safety. Okay, so that this is a group of people that um, also understand us, so while we may have some things that are a bit crazy that we do, um, songs that you may know, other kinds of things, think about all the different fan things that you may enjoy, have similar kinds of things. You have certain colors that you might wear, certain artifacts that you might have, um, different mascots, icons, all of these things. And so it starts off, we can, you know, part of the area that we see fandom is in sports. In this case, K-State is not just a sports thing, it's the university as a whole, the sports play a part of it, but it's also, I'm a fan of the institution, and a life, I um, graduated from there, I met my husband there, um, and it's a place I'm a lifetime alumni member, and it's one that when people ask me where to go to school in Kansas, I have a pretty good answer uh, in terms of where to tell them. Um, and I also went to the other school down the road, University of Kansas, a little bit of a rivalry, but still this idea of fandom that can be a part of how you connect, for me, it's a way I connect with my own family, because my aunts and my, my mom went there, um, but then also how you connect to people around the world. And so what's funny is at times if we're wearing K-State stuff, we've um, run into other K-Staters around the world. So like in Prague and other kinds of places, we're like, oh my gosh, okay, so we have an idea. We're also the representatives for the alumni in Bulgaria. So if there are K-Staters that show up in Bulgaria, they have our contact information to get in touch with us. And when we look at the list of things, there's a lot of people. So it's a, com it's a core community that we can actually connect with. So, Partly what happens and when we look online and what changes from physical, so the, the a fandom community that we had when we were there, very much going to sports 
kinds of things going to other activities on campus, wearing purple, all of that. But then with the internet, it brings us a way to con stay connected to that fandom, to connect to that family, and participate in a, in a way that we, can't, we couldn't necessarily prior to it. So it allows us to connect with fan spaces across geographical boundaries. So we can all participate in different kind of fan communities regardless of where we are. We can interact with fan objects. So we can create movies, we can have our own kinds of things we do, we load up pictures, we get a chance to actually connect with whatever it is that we're a fan of. And then it also gives us a chance to extend that fan object. So in terms of thinking about it, it's now, I, I don't have to just say I'm part of a community through there, but then I can extend that celebration of it. And this is where we get into areas of fan fiction and fan content. So this is just one example in terms of things um, in, in fandom, we see it throughout different kind of group, fan groups, right? So a lot that are represented here today. So we have Doctor, um, Doctor Who fans that are across the globe, exactly, um, and that you can find and you have your favorite doctor and you know, and you don't even have to refer to them by their names, you know 10, 11, 9, 1, whichever one that you're excited about, but you don't have to necessarily go into that full detail. So you have a specialized language, you have different kind of symbols, there's a certain noise. So for Doctor Who fans, if you hear the app for the TARDIS, you'll look around, someone had, when that became the real popular app, it was kind of like, okay, who else likes this here? <laughs> those things, so you find this, and so you can find ways to connect with people then in lots of different places when you recognize those kind of objects, and you get a chance to weave them into your life and kind of work with them. Part of the reason why fandom is becoming something more important that we study is because of a whole line that we're looking at in terms of fractured fandom. And what we are seeing in some cases, so one of the benefits or positive things about fandom is it does give us a chance to celebrate and have fun and be lighthearted and usually find people that we can connect with when the outside world tends to push us to an other kind of position. So this is, you know, if you're really excited about sci-fi, you're a little weird for some people, right? If you're really excited about K-State, you're a little weird or whatever. You're, you know, for some people that don't get being a fan, it can be strange. So they other, and put you in that kind of strange category. And for people that are used to constantly be put in that category, that fan culture, that fan community, fan family, becomes all important. What we're seeing though now is because some of those, um, individuals are being challenged within that. We're seeing a change in fandom. So that we're seeing more diverse people coming into different groups as they become more interesting across gender, ethnicity, and age. What was traditionally the core base of the family is getting challenged. And so we're starting to see some really extreme kind of responses, whether it's looking at Ashley Judd and getting um, attacked on Twitter because she made a, a comment about a sports team that she was watching, or we're looking at um, individuals who, uh, across the spectrum, attacked in Reddit or 4chan or any of these kinds of spaces because they're trying to participate in a fan community that they don't, you know, that's not necessarily welcoming to them. So it's one that we're wanting to look at as scholars more and more because these places are important. These families in fandom are important. And so we wanna understand how do we start to create those kind of communities then that celebrate that fun, that keep it on that um, a celebration kind of level and be inclusive of those differences that can come in so that it's a safe space for all people, not just for the ones that maybe were a traditional group, but that we can actually open it up to others. All right. So when we go in the idea of fandom, also underlying fandom, is the idea of fun, so the importance of fun. So I, in terms of the pictures I chose, I didn't have to go searching for ones I have copyright, I use my own. Um, play and fun are integral to who we are as human beings. So when we look at what we do and how we understand who we are, um, a sense of fun is really important. If you look at how children learn, it's through fun, and not necessarily through specialized games that are designed for them, but it's how they interact with the world. It's how you interacted with the world um, as you were learning and growing. And so it's part of how we d figure out who our identity is, who we are in a group, and what are the expectations of how we work with others in those kinds of groups. But it's also then, what we're starting to recognize is the importance of that sense of fun for learning throughout life. So it's not just about as a kid, it's about how do you manage to include that fun throughout the life that you have. It can help us actually 
face life's challenges and the changes that happen, and it can also help us feel better about those changes and challenges. So that idea of figuring out, and not trying to say that fan or fun is just something that's outside of our life, and that it was something that you did when you were young, but then you get serious, you grow up, and you get a mortgage, and you get kids, and you know, you just become boring and stressed all your time. It's like, no, it's saying, hey, how do we actually try to figure out how to live a life that involves that as well? Because it tends to be a life that is more fulfilling and also insulates you from those changes in life that can actually lead to more stress. And not only that, in terms of what it can help you as an individual, it can also help you in terms of um, the world and how you interact with the world. So I have some examples of fun. One, this comes from, when we look at um, kind of one of the buzz terms that's going around right now is gamification. Have we heard this? Yeah, so we have the idea of when we're taking game kind of mechanics and game structures and narratives and putting them into non-game context. So how do we make learning fun in a game kind of sense? How do we do a lot of different things? And there's some really good articles that are out there. Um, one was from TechCrunch that was talking about it's not just that we add, a, add rewards or add you know, a princess to save and points to win, that we have to think about what's the fun, what's the game in that activity. So there's one that I found. So coming here and trying to figure out how to learn Bulgarian and all those other kinds of things, I was trying to find different languages. And so as I was starting to play different, trying to figure out how do I learn different stuff, I've always wanted to learn languages. I'm not very good at it. Um, so I was trying to find ways that might be interesting. So I found this one, this, so is Memrise um, website. That it's a fun, it was actually, um, there was a challenge to learn how to read a uh, Mandarin, I think it was, um, ma Mandarin menu. So um, it was, you go through different um, games to this and what it's, it has elements of sharing between crowds because you get, people get to nominate different pictures that would match to what it is you're trying to remember what this is. And you play it and it has this whole notion of, you start to learn and grow, and it has a whole growth metaphor, it has a whole plant metaphor, so you water the plants each time you go back and you know, all these kinds of things. So it has it through there, and I thought, okay, this was fun, I'm bored, I'll just go ahead and do this, and I don't like being bored. So um, I'll play this game and see what happens through there. And I was like, okay, who knows what if it actually worked. And then we were in Prague, and there's actually a Chinese restaurant in the old town of Prague area, and it has the, the sign in the characters. And I was like, oh, that's what it is. And Mark was looking like, how do you know that? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, it must be that game. Okay, so I can actually read the sign. It doesn't mean I can actually communicate anything other than at least I know what food I'm eating is what I'll recognize um, when I go ahead and get it. But it was still a thing that was a just, oh my gosh, I actually did learn something through this. So finding out, way, one of the ways that we found um, in terms of you look at education, languages um, are a lot of times the ones we're looking at finding more games um, to make learning languages fun. There's another one that we have that is, that I like, here is it, is it this one? Yeah, okay. So this is basically, it's language, but it's also helping feed the world. So it's freerice.org. And so if you need to practice, if you know you have a GRE exam coming up, if you're going on to graduate school, um, or another kind of thing, and you need to practice your vocabulary, the first levels are pretty easy. And so what ends up happening, you have to keep playing, but it does actually get into quite complex vocabulary. Each time as you click through, essentially how it ends up working is that because of the ads that show up, um, each time you click and go through there, they end up donating and you end up donating rice um, to help others. So you play, sit there, so those of you who like Scrabble or those other kinds of, you like word games anyway, this is one that you can actually play. You can work on your own vocabulary and help the world. So it's finding these weird ways where you connect fun and um, things that you like or what you need to learn and also for helping people in different kinds of areas. And the idea of he helping people as well there's a lot of good examples in terms of using games to help solve big scientific problems that are plaguing, um, kind of, that have been around for a very long time. So one was an example, Fold It. One of the examples from Fold It was actually helping with AIDS um, and a breakthrough within um, AIDS science and trying to understand more with HIV. And so this is using actually, again, harnessing games, the idea of people wanting to pro um, problem solve and play and identify things that end up having benefits outside of that. So it's using that innate sense of fun and problem solving and immersive experiences and actually having it have a really good outcome rather than just that you hit level whatever in Candy Crush or you've now managed to get past whatever level in Angry Birds. It's saying, okay, well how do we take those same kind of skills of finding and matching things or playing with figuring out how do I make these kinds of changes and do it for problems within science that 
can end up moving things forward. And what's interesting particularly is that in general, your brain is better than most computers that we have out there, right? So we, in terms of when we're talking about matching patterns, when we're talking about understanding and seeing differences and these kinds of things, the human brain is better than much what, of what we have out there. And so if we harness a bunch of people who are excited, who are really wanting to get a chance to play and do something neat, then they can help solve problems that we haven't been able to solve otherwise, right? that we don't have that capability to do. So in terms of my own life, um, one of the things that, let's see, oh, sorry, well, one last one I want to do. So kind of putting, putting back together both fan and fun, so, and it also gets into my examples through there, so con man. So, um, I'm a fan of the television show Firefly and the movie Serenity and all these kinds of things. So, I've been, um, it's been one of the things that I love for a very long time. Um, and it was, it's one of those that, it was a television show that got canceled too soon. It's sad. For those who love it, it's sad that it's gone. It has a really rich um, fan fiction group and it, or um, community, and it has, they're pretty kind of, they, they fit the term for fan, uh, fanatical um, fans kind of thing, so in terms of what they're able to do. This is an example of some of the stuff that what they've been able to do. So these are two of the actors that were from that show, and so they've decided to come up with a new show that it's gonna be a comedy about two characters who are on the sci-fi convention tour um, who had a television show about space that was then canceled too soon, and then now they're on this. So it's basically, it's a little bit autobiographical, but they did an Indiegogo campaign, and they weren't entirely sure how well it would go. They originally, their original target was only 425,000 for a series. They're now over, $2 million, moving on to $2.5 million. And that was it. They reached their target, I think, in less than four hours um, in terms of this. And then as they went through, they basically busted most of the timeline um, kind of uh, records up to this point. So it's the idea of taking people who are, that are very excited about something and finding that and connecting with them and how can we bring them in to bring new things that we can also be excited about and have fun with. One of the things, so in terms of thinking about research that I do that looks at communication and technology um, is a lot of what I look at. And so part of what I, I'm fascinated by this, by how quickly and how well this is done um, and what that means. So one of the things that then, because I try to figure out how do I weave in the things that I like to do into work that I have to do, okay? So this is kind of that example of how that works. Um, the example, the study though that I want to share with you is actually from, a conference that I did, sorry, let's pull this back up. Okay, so it's from a conference that I did um, back in November. So I've been a fan of comic books for a really long time. Um, I was pushed out of it though, because girls weren't supposed to like that. Um, and and it, was, it wasn't exactly, the things that I remember, it was not, you know, kind or easy kinds of pushing out. It was like physically saying, get the hell out of the room kind of stuff from the little boys that were also playing with the comic books. Um, so I was not allowed, I was not supposed to read those um, and play with those kinds of things. And so, but I still kept an interest, but it did something that I was distanced from it. But as I've gotten to, so I, I try to stay into those kind of communities and look at those kinds of things. And so what ended up happening, Mark reads, my husband reads a lot of different comics. And he also finds, he's my fiction pusher. He finds stuff that will, I, that he thinks I'll like, and then I get hooked into it. So um, I have a couple different friends that find things that are fun for me. So this is one of the ways to help keep fun in your life. Find friends that have really great taste that say, hey, have you read this or have you seen that? And then next thing you know, you're hooked into it. So Mark mentioned this, and it was also a colleague of mine at another conference I was very good friends with. He does some work occasionally on superheroes. It started out as looking at traditional heroes. So looking at, you know, Greek literature, those kinds of things. So ancient Greek and Roman and all those kinds of stuff that he was studying. And then he's looking at how we see it today. Um, and so he was saying, and so this is again fun and fan, we were talking about all these fan things, excited about having comic books that we can talk about. We can do research on this stuff. How cool is that? There was also a, a Comic-Con in the conference hall next to our academic conference. So we blew off the academic conference for an afternoon and went to the Comic-Con. 
And we could say it was for research, right? So we're in the pop culture area. So we're all the other people are like going, okay, we have our serious panels. We're like, we're doing research too, man. It's just a different area than what you do. Um, and so then we had all these conversations and I get this message on Facebook that says, okay, I had a dream. This is my, from my friend, Mike Milford. He says, I had a dream. My dream was that Lynette chaired and put a panel together on superheroes and, and comic books. And it was with another friend from, two other friends from graduate school. And he said, you know, basically like, go to it. And I was like, sure, why not? Sounds like fun. So I was like, so I did. So I went and he's like, this is good. I need to have these like commandments out to people more often. And then we ended up doing, and we had a really cool panel. And um, it's a lot of fun. And it's now moving from a presentation that we've done to a book proposal. And so we're going to be writing a book on this stuff too. Um, and we've been approached by a publisher and all these kinds of things. So it's been kind of what started out as a guy just, first of all, just a fun conversation. And then a friend of mine just being silly kind of online to a panel that we had and then being approached and kind of moving things forward. So having that notion of both something that you love, kind of fanatical about, and also that's fun as a way of how you can choose the different things that you do. So I wanted to give you a little shot of what I also talked about so that it's more in depth than this, um, than just talking about all the different examples, but how you can actually get into analysis and how you can look at some of these ideas. So sometimes this is a good thing, the idea of studying what you love. Sometimes it's a bit too much like learning how sausage is made. You may not want to. Right? So there's a fine line that you decide. What do you want to make a focus of, of things? Do you, do you just want to do something because it's fun, or do you also want to understand it? For me, I tend to mix the two. Though there's some things that I'm not that concerned about knowing more about. I just like doing them. There are some things that I like to understand more um, and figure out why is it that this is important for me. And part of it is by understanding, um, in this regard, understanding more of what's happening within some of the comic book realm, particularly with regards to women. Um, so in terms of fan and fun, I'm a fan of women. I've been one for 41 years now. Um, I am 41 years old. Um, so I started out that way. But it's mainly been the stuff that I study. I enjoy doing that. I find, particularly when professors tell me that, well, women didn't do that, that's the first time when I start then researching the topic proposal for a paper that talks about women in X. And that's what I've done throughout the time. It's like, oh, no, no, women weren't in ancient Greece. They didn't participate in stuff. I'm like, but professor, there's a, there was a law that women couldn't practice law or medicine. He's like, yeah. I'm like, so clearly women actually did practice law and medicine because otherwise you don't have a law against it unless they tried it, right? Because we don't have laws against cats teaching in, a, in, our, in AUBG, right? We don't have that yet because that hasn't happened yet. The minute it does, maybe then we'll have some comments from the provost that perhaps this is not the highest level of education for us, right? But if there's a law there, that means that people were doing it. If there were women in comic books, if there's women that are playing it, then this is something that we can look at as well and understand kind of how this fits. Particularly looking at the reboot that's come out with Ms., um, from Ms. Marvel to Captain Marvel, kind of looking at that change and partially looking at the shifting gender narratives. What I found interesting about the reboot article was that it, it faces and it talks about a lot of the same issues that women in a lot of different organizations have to deal with. So what's interesting with comic books is that they don't just sit there outside of life, they reflect what's going on within life. This has been the case when they looked at integration um, within the military forces, so within racial integration, those were also explored in comic books, looking at different kinds of issues about nationalities and um, and military conflicts and these things are explored within comic books. Also issues like Watchmen, other kinds of things that talk about power differentials um, and questioning about who is watching whom within a society, right? So they, they, comic books take on heavy topics and they help us to understand the world in a different way. So what I wanted to do was understand a little bit more about this kind of narrative of her moving from, she's already had the power, she's been doing the job of Captain Marvel, but she was Ms. Marvel. And in this one, they're saying moving her from Ms. to actually being Captain Marvel. Okay, and it's a full, the first issue is looking at kind of that change moving from her from that point on to actually taking the name. And so that's what I was interested in looking at. So in terms of when we're looking at timeline-wise, so this is July 2012, Carol Danvers is the character. She's presented now as Captain Marvel. And when we're looking at this, it was hugely successful. Um, the author for the series is Kelly Sue DeConnick. 
Artist was Dexter Soy for the first ones. He was also the one that did the redesign of the costume. This has been a lot of conversation about the redesign. Um, again, it kind of gets in to that idea of challenging the fandom of others that are there, but it was a case of also, they've, they've talked a lot about why they made the choices, and you'll get to see them here in just a second. So in terms of with, we're looking at Captain Marvel specifically, and comics as hugely popular. Generally, when the, partially the important of the costume redesign is that we're looking at um, the changes of what was done before. Often we see feminine um, or female characters as hyper-femininity. They tend to have very scantily clothed um, kinds of costume, I mean, in terms of the art for them. And it's a concern in terms of, and particularly when they talk about making the choices of redesigning the costume, the concerns were there because we're talking about if you're getting fandom with little girls, those kinds of things, how do you want that to be depicting? So you got little boys running around with Superman costumes, not worrying necessarily about the sexuality of the costume, right? Spider-Man, any of these kinds of things. But when you start working into, well, how does a little girl necessarily, unless she decides to be Spider-Man or Superman or any of the others, how does she necessarily have a costume? Do you really want your eight-year-old running around in a bikini with a whip? You know, kind of questions in terms of what you want to see in terms of that. And so the interesting kind of questions through there. So some more detail. We had a total of 17 issues in the relaunch. We basically see this through here. The reaction was interesting. Some of the times it was saying that, oh my gosh, I cannot believe how you could possibly do this to this character. This is not how this is. We're hoping that you'll return back to the normal Captain Marvel. This is not how this should be, right? We need a different kind of arc through that. And then others were saying, no, this is a good thing, because we actually have a fully realized female um, hero, um, and the results were overwhelmingly po positive. They have a lot of really cool um, fan groups now. So there's Carol Core, which is a whole group that's kind of formed around Carol Danvers as the character. Um, also, in terms of the first female-led um, comic book movie, uh, Captain Marvel will be coming out. I think it got pushed back with the latest change with Spider-Man, so I think we're now at 2019. But um, originally, it was going to be coming out in 2018. So the idea that it's kind of important in terms of looking at this one as a shift that we're seeing. In the past, when it's been tried to bring it in, it tends to be more shut down earlier on. This one has been successful in kind of redesigning and reimagining what a superhero could be. And so that a superhero doesn't need to be that we say uh, superhero and the default is male. We can say superhero and this is what a superhero looks like and is, and it could be both male and female in terms of some of those characters. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose that femininity in it as well. So, one of the, so I wanna show you some of the art and changes through that. Um, but before we do that, give you a little bit of background on the idea of gender bias in um, fiction. So in terms of where this fits, and as a kind of looking at what we see within, how do you wanna say, is a basic kind of test for what we see as gender bias and or gender balance. Um, the Bechdel test is a really simple one for looking at gender bias. You would think more fiction could actually um, meet this. It's a relatively small kind of scale, like in terms of very easy to fit through. You need to have at least two women in the fiction. They need to actually talk to each other about something other than men. And that, they've also said the idea that the women should actually have names and at least 60 seconds of conversation if it's, again, in terms of film or those kinds of things. So you think in general, that's pretty easy. It's amazing how few things actually fit this, right? That most of the places that might actually have female characters in it, they are merely objects for, a, or a plot device. They are objects for, um, or the, you know, the beginning of tension between male characters a lot of these kinds of things. So it is actually really hard to find at times stuff that fits this. And so with this, there are some definite critiques of the Bechtel test, but it's a good one to start out looking at this. In terms of looking at the relaunch, it meets this test, but it goes much further than that. Because what we have here, the scripts that it provides, it can function in the way that comic books can to really give us a narrative of how we can then talk about things in our own lives. So one of the things that we have a lot with um, different kinds of books about leaning in, um, about women taking control, how do they move up the ladder in business, and these kinds of questions. There's not a really good narrative of how to do that, right? Because basically, if you have what would be normally leadership, you're either bossy or a bitch, um, and that's kind of a narrow way of doing So it's like, not a really clear idea of how do you actually make the argument for a woman taking control. 
And so this one actually goes through, and what I think that's interesting in the script is actually we have the narratives that go through this kind of question of the arc talking about how does a woman take a promotion? How do women and men actually talk about these kinds of things? One of the things they talk about for any kind of leadership is the need for mentors. How do you identify those? Um, can you have flawed female characters that are heroic? We can have flawed male heroes. We have lots of examples of those. Can we have those in female characters as well? Can we have multiple female characters in pivotal roles? Or is it the case that if we have too many women, we can't, you know, we got to change things up. We got to end up having someone. Like if you look at panel game shows or other things like that, we can often have four men or we can have two women and two men. But if it's all of a sudden a panel of four women, oh, it's now the view or some just feminist thing. It can't just be a discussion of something through there, right? So kind of questions through there. Um, and then also the idea of having female characters save the day and also talking about re, um, I don't know, so bringing forward the history, refinding, reimagining, not reimagining, but recovering the histories of women in lots of different kinds of areas. So this is also, it also talks about the tension of key characters within here as well. In the end, when I look at this, and I'll show you the examples in a minute, there is a tension between the language and the visuals. So we do have some issues, especially the early redesign makes sense. It fits this narrative of empowering women, showing different kinds of things of how you would be a leader and how you would shift within those kinds of um, roles that you might see, kind of situations that you might find. But we do have a bit of a concern is there's still some of that um, same kind of holdover of some of the com um, conversations through there. It can also have the possibility of kind of re-enlivening those kind of conversations about whether or not a woman can take this kind of role, those kind of things. So it still has tensions that we're working through, and in part because they actually fit, they fit the shift of the tensions that we're seeing within society. There's a lot of stuff that says they want to have gender balance, that we want to have more women in places of power. We recognize that educating women and helping them do well helps around the world. Um, that it's a crucial developmental issue um, when we look at um, different countries, these kinds of things, but it's still a tension of how do you do that and why would we do that, and then what does that change to cultural values and practices and traditions when you decide to do that, and, so, and how that can be disruptive. So we're seeing that shift within there, um, but I wanna focus on the art rather than necessarily entirely. We'll talk a little bit about the narrative, but we'll look at some of the art, um, maybe. Do, 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 do. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go to the art. Okay. We'll talk. We'll go back to the characters. So this is the change um, of what she used to be. So this is what she used to be in terms of it. More traditional kind of comic book character. Also same kind of comic book character pose for fe females. Men generally did not pose this way. You don't see Hulk in a fancy with a cute little coquettish kind of way. Um, so partially, and they've actually talked about why they made the changes that they did. There are some people, again, still don't like. This is much more the traditional Captain Marvel comic that was his costume. So it's much more traditional kind of costume. It's an older school version of it. So it has a, a feeling more back to the original time. But she's also in more of a superpower or superhero pose in terms of it. She looks like she could actually be the one that is supposed to be like the greatest superhero of all times in that kind of pose. The other one looks like she's ready to go out dancing. All right, so a little question in terms of where we see in terms of this. In terms of when they argue, they actually talked about what I think is fascinating with comic books is you get to have the, um, the still have the interaction. So it's a print or online, but they have through letters to, um, they have a little letter section where people write in. And they also have both the author and the artist talking. And they talk about the idea of why we went ahead and had some costume, why he made the costume choices that he did. So um, he said the over sexiness of the outfit would often rightfully and wrongfully cause the character to be dismissed outright by people that were unfamiliar with her history. Okay, she has a very rich history in terms of what she's done. To be more blunt, it's not a costume most fathers would want their daughters dressing up in on Halloween. Right. So the idea of thinking about, well, how do we want, if we want this to be something that's inspiring, this kind of backstory, again, which is what we have with superheroes, that we want this kind of thing. How do we go ahead and encourage that? What do we do? And partly the thinking about the redesign within there. A little bit of background on Carol. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with her, we'll go back for her real quick. Um, Carol Danvers is very important. Um, she was, at one point, airport, 
Air Force pilot. She went on to become, oh, I can't remember. I have, don't have my notes on every little thing about her. She was huge, though, in terms of where she went from one thing to the other. She absolutely deserves the, the title of Captain Marvel in terms of her history, in terms of what she did. She wasn't just someone who made the tea, even though those people can be important, too. Within the character that we have of the relaunch, Tracy Burke, also a famed reporter. Most of the characters in the reboot have a clear kind of um, purpose. Famed reporter, 60-year-old. We see diversity within this, so you actually have diversity in age um, through there, um, and also health. You have the fictional pilot, Helen Cobb, who brings the real history of women who passed the test flight um, into go into space. And then Banshee Squadron, which were actually, so this was a whole thing that they did in a travel arc, time travel, to again show these kinds of things of the roles that women played at different times through history. So it covers a lot of ground, this, this new beginning of um, Captain Marvel. So in terms of looking at how the change happened, so there's a couple of different um, scenes that talk about whether or not she should take the mantle of Captain Marvel. So this one, they're fighting this monster. And again, normal smack talk in terms of lucky me if it ain't Captain America's secretary, Mrs. Marvel. And going through there, and then he's like, what do you mean, you know, in terms of talking about those kinds of things. I mean, get this. Wouldn't catch me getting bossed around by no broad. Those kinds of questions through there. Again, fictional, but it's also things that women have to deal with a lot of times in terms of whether or not you're actually going to be taken seriously in a role, how that's going to work through there, and how we actually... Um, then talk through these kinds of questions. So this is after this session, um, session with them, they talk with another set of people that she's working with here. So this is different parts of her crew, daring her to, in case in terms of looking at mentorship, we find through this one daring her to take the name of Captain Marvel, kind of going through here. Another one says, bottom line is you've led the Avengers, you've saved the world, quit being an adjunct, take the mantle. And a lot of times that what it actually is what ne is needed for women, unfortunately, is someone saying, no, you should take the role. Actually stepping up and saying to do it, because more often than not, we're told that we shouldn't, that we're not worthy of it, we can't do it, those kinds of things. It ends with the discussion of her saying, and as she's flying out into outer space, because she can do that, she's taking the name. And what we have is one, in terms of what's getting picked up, on t-shirts and on other fan fiction and other kinds of things is this last piece. And we will be the stars we were always meant to be. And it's this arc again in terms of saying where we go. And that's what a lot of what's inspired. Carol Core inspired a lot of different women in terms of what this means then um, as the comic book, I mean, in terms of for the comic book goes for it, but also what it means to have powerful female characters that we can, again, create that kind of fandom world around. That it can be something that moves something forward and gives us a way to actually deal with many of the issues that we deal with. So it's not, as much as it is a comic book and it's a, outside our, the normal world, most of us can't go into space yet, right? Can't fly up there. But we can talk about it in terms of how do we go beyond our own life, beyond of where we are, to something greater, to something more. And that's what superheroes do. And that's why they're important that we have female superheroes that we can also understand, that we can also work with, that we can also aspire to be, and why that's important that we have. So then in terms of, um, these were some other pictures. So that was of Tracy, and then that's the Banshee Squad. So again, you have a variety of drawings in here that allow a, lo a lo larger range of female depiction than what we normally get. So that was basically the presentation that I gave at my conference a little bit shortened out for you. But basically it comes down for me, a lot of times you get this question of, well, it's real life now, and either I do fandom or fun things, or, and I, or I do real life. And I don't think it has to be that. I was really lucky at my old university, at University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, I met a professor there, Dr. Lynn Hawley, and she studies intergenerational um, and um, gerontology kinds of issues, so older individuals. And what was fascinating was for her to, partially that what's fascinating is that she's also quite old in terms of, um, she got her PhD, I believe, when she was in her 70s, 60s or 70s, 60s. Um, and so it was interesting to have that too, have her be a junior faculty member, um, but considerable my junior, I um, mean my senior, sorry, um, through there. 
and having her talk about the choices that she made. And what I think is fascinating about a lot of what she would say is that what becomes our life as we go, as we become older, is basically a series of the choices that we make. That there's, the more we do studies, that old age does not have to mean that we lose our faculties, that we cannot be active, that we cannot be vibrant and alive and fully formed within a community. It's, it's a basis of what, what choices that we make. If we choose well through life, then we are supported into that point and we can still be that. We see these examples around the world. This. So it doesn't have to mean that, that getting older is a bad thing. What tends to happen though is that when we make choices that limit our chance for fun, limit our chance for our brains to continue to grow, that's when we have more cases of problems with Alzheimer's, dementia, when you see other problems in terms of like physical disability and problems that happen over age. Um, can often be because we've limited our life to the point that we're not enjoying the things that we used to enjoy. That we figure this has to be serious, so that means not fun. Things can be serious, but fun. You can do serious research about crazy topics. I have friends that are deciding to do research, continue doing research about comic books. Some that are, became a home brewer, and so decided there's a whole community of people who brew their own beer. So he's gonna study them and understand more of how that community comes together. Lots of different ways that you can look at. So it can be something serious, but it can also be fun. Um, and so thinking about in, in your own ways that you look at things now, you may be taking classes and majors that you have to do, but you also, when you are given the choice and said you get to choose a topic, you can choose a topic that you find fun and that you're a fan, that it's something that you want to explore. We have good examples, some of our professors from political science study also looking at superheroes as well and looking at politics within that. Um, so it doesn't have to be held. There's good examples for history, any kind of things. Even economics can be fun, I believe. <laughs> um, so I'm told. Uh, so there's a whole range of stuff that you can find that you could do that's enjoyable. So think about how you can keep that in because if you can figure out how when you leave here to continue bringing in, weaving in when you can, the things that you love, what you find fun, if you can keep that, then you'll be more healthy, able to handle those problems over the course of your life because you have that buffer zone, because you have that thing that you can go to when other stuff doesn't work well. So that would be my encouragement for you, is to not have it be that it's one or the other, that instead it's figuring out how do I weave these parts into my life, the, thing, the ways that it makes sense. So thank you very much for your time. We do have some time for questions too, if you have any. <laughs> I'll leave that there. Any questions? Yeah. When you mentioned the Berger test, uh -huh. did the two women talk about the Berger test during the conversation? Oh, I haven't had anyone do that. No, that's an interesting thing. If they talk, I w that would be an interesting thing to write to have it be a critique of the Bechdel test and part of the fiction. I haven't heard one yet that does that. Yeah, because I saw such a joke on the internet. Mm -hmm. yeah, two women walking to a bar talking about the Bechdel test. Ah, yes. Well, as long as they weren't talking about another guy, yeah, we're good. It passes the test then. <laughs> Questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for your time. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu talks.